I've found through those years that 98% of the questions I got from producers were really kind of nutrition related. I don't want to say the other disciplines aren't important. I've got other people I can ask those questions to here. Thank goodness. But uh, yeah, working in the, the realm of nutrition quite a bit. Dr. Boyles, thanks for uh, joining us today. Uh, looking forward to discussing some of these areas of, uh, of your interest and of your background. Uh, you've had a really long career in extension. Um, I guess give us a little background of you know where you come from, uh, your education and, and your academia experience. Sure. Uh, I grew up on a farm. My father managed a, a research station for Ohio State and uh, we also had our a family farm, and uh, growing up, I was familiar with draft horses. Uh, the research farm had tractors, but we didn't have track a tractor on our home farm till I was about 16 years old, and did much of our work with uh, now draft horses, which was wonderful in that uh, that's almost like traveling through time. Uh, but grew up mainly around beef cattle and sheep. I probably lean more towards the, the beef cattle area uh, as far as my professional career. Um, I went to, uh, well, I'll tell you my age, they know it as Virginia Tech now, but when I went there, it was VPI. Uh, I got my uh, bachelor's and then I got a master's degree at Ohio State and then a PhD really focused on nutrition uh, at Kansas State University. And, my first job out of the, the shoot was in North Dakota. And I credit some mentors helping me, you know, guide me along, but a, a wonderful place to live. And the people there were wonderful. But then an opportunity kind of came along to head back home closer to family. So I've been at Ohio State for about 31 years, and they're going to have me about one more month. <laughs> I'm going to retire. I've found through those years that 98% of the questions I got from producers were really kind of nutrition related. I don't want to say the other disciplines aren't important. I've got other people I can ask those questions to here. Thank goodness. But uh, yeah, working in the, the realm of nutrition quite a bit. Uh, I'm also our state coordinator for beef quality assurance. Uh, and so I work a lot in that area as well. A healthy digestive tract is a prerequisite for overall calf health and performance. It affects the absorption and utilization of nutrients and influences the calf's immune system. Digesteron Calf from DSM Furminish is a phytogenic product that can help benefit gut bacteria to improve gut functionality, immunity, and performance. Take care of your calves with Digesteron Calf. Visit dsm.com forward slash Digesteron to learn more. Well, congratulations, first of all, of, of a long career, and uh, I hope you enjoy this next step of, of your life. Of, um, so that, that's great. It's great. You know, back, back to your comment about draft horses, it's always interesting. Of We've got, there's several ranches still today that use draft horses for, for different reasons and, and still put up hay with horses and use beaver slides, and so... You know, it's, it's a really cool aspect that that tradition is still going on in some areas. I'd rather work uh, cattle on a horse than a four wheeler. That's just, that's me. You and me both. You and me both. So uh, I still hold hold very firmly to a lot of traditional ways of working animals. And and uh, so but you do see the aspects of where uh, mechanical uh, machinery, etc., come in that really helps with that efficiencies. But Absolutely. Uh, so uh, I, I think the first area that we want to discuss is uh, uh, of your areas of, of interest is uh, prepartum cow nutrition. And so, what are some issues that are challenged, in, especially in your areas of your producers that that they're really faced with, with you know that late gestation time point and getting cows ready for for calving and, and prepared to go in that breeding season. Yeah, uh, I often say to producers, if if we don't feed those cows prior to calving uh, properly, that's where you can see cattle back up on you. Uh, I worked with Dr. Harlan Hughes at North Dakota, an ag economist, but very much followed beef cattle uh, production. And he said, you know, Steve, 
the U.S. cow herd takes a vacation about every seven years. You know, we're staying on that 365. So if you feed a cow poorly after calving, well, she's not gonna, she's not gonna conceive. So we need to change our mindset. I, it's great to focus on good nutrition after calving, but really that last 50 to 60, 60 days, two thirds of the fetal growth occurs. Now the calories got to come from somewhere. That thing stays the size of a soccer ball uh, for much of gestation. But then we see this gradual increase in fetal development. And then, you know, and it comes back to even to period three, if you've got a cow that's thin uh, at, after weaning, that is the time, it's the cheapest time to improve cow condition. Now, if we accomplish that, then nutrition doesn't have to be complicated that last 50 or 60 days, but maybe we're gonna start getting off that lowest quality hay. Maybe it's you look at the worst stuff in early fall, then let's improve what we have providing to those cows uh, during that latter part of gestation. And then obviously the highest nutrient requirements are after calving, we gotta take care of milk. Another thing, now that's about conception, trying to get 365 a day a year but colostrum veterinarians and i'm sure other people know the better the nutrition prior to calving the better quality the colostrum and so there's another reason that's going to reduce all many health issues with with cattle uh, i'm that's kind of i know israel's in a war right now but i was contacted about their calf survival rates and I, sus I suspect that maybe once again, they're probably not paying attention to maybe that third uh, trimester uh, of gestation where we improve the quality of the colostrum. And then we're gonna reduce perhaps some of the issues with overall calf survival, because most of those survival issues are early after birth. And I, there could be myriad of physiological issues, uh, you know, Colostrum is just a passive immunity, but what about the immune system for that calf? It's developing more and more in that last third of gestation. So I think we, if when I, as a nutritionist, and I get asked about calf survival, I'm looking, well, where can I change things to make that calf better prepared when it comes out of the dam? And so, well, I, I come back to, we maybe need to do some feed analysis uh, certainly in the fall, but maybe you've got your hay targeted and say, well, this is my second best hay. Well, let's maybe allocate that for uh, that January, February, or whenever you have a uh, time period. And then you say the best of the best uh, for uh, after calving. So I, there's a, so ma a myriad of things here that certainly a veterinarian has got to come into play. But if we think about our nutrition program, what are we doing? That are, are we at 365? If we're not, then we got to start asking those questions about nutrition as a player uh, within that system. Yeah, you, you mentioned hay quality and testing. And so, you know, that, that was been one of my biggest challenges sometimes with producers is that, uh, you know, they would call you and say, my hay is generally this. And, and and I, and I pushed back and said, hey, can you get that tested for me just to make sure? And, you know, one instance I had a producer call and said, my, my hay is generally about 9, 10% crew protein. I said, can, can you get that hay tested for us and then we'll proceed with the ration? So he calls me back a couple of weeks later and it was 4% crew protein. Uh, to be honest, I find that interesting, uh, especially out in Western states. Ohio is not a Western state, but... Uh, the forage out there is tough. I mean, it can survive drought and wonderful things, but I find the quality uh, to some of your listeners that are west of the Missouri River, uh, that the quality can probably drop a little bit quicker as it matures and say not fescue when we talk about here in a high orchard grass. You know, I, it's interesting how I, uh, some people have a higher uh, opinion of what I can do. They, they, like you, they say, well, I think it's about 9%. And so I'm supposed to be a magician or a soothsayer. <laughs> True story. I had a person that was having severe cow nutrition problems. And the producer said, well, I've got 
straight alfalfa. And he did. I went up into the top of the barn and I said, uh, how old is this hay? He said, oh, about 10 years old. So it was nothing but stems. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a producer once feeding a 15 year old corn silage and it was black as black. Yeah. But, you know, we do see those challenges of, of people think something is better than what they have. And, and they run into those wrecks of, you know, thinner cows at calving, uh, colostrum issues uh, of, you know, calf sickness. And so that, that can be a challenge of o overlooking a key step in, in that management. Well, get comments about, well, I don't want to overfeed the cows because that can increase birth weight. But and it can't. You can feed corn silage and, you know, overfeed it. Yeah, you can get into trouble, but you can't starve calving knees out of a cow. So feed analysis will tell how much to feed. It, do you need, can you use soy hulls as an energy source? Not much of protein, but they're great as an energy source. Or do you need some sort of protein supplement? And I know they're expensive and we sure don't want to overfeed them. So yeah, that feed analysis, uh, you know, you buy a pickup truck and there on that window is all the specs on that truck. And we think that's pretty important. Well, the majority of your cost of maintaining a cow is feed. Maybe we ought to look at the side of the bag <laughs> or something and see what that analysis is. Yeah, I, I think that's a really key point that, that we preach is that uh... The, the more you know, the better decisions you can make and having that feed analysis of what exactly you're going to feed is important Then allocating, like you said, allocating those quality reserves for for key periods of time is really a major cost savings to producers uh, that sometimes gets overlooked. Well, it's, it's cheap, you know, what a forage analysis cost and you don't have to do it as soon as the haze may. In fact, I, I discourage that. Let it get rained on a little bit in the fall, <laughs> and then, then give it a go uh, as far as checking. Look, then that forces you to look at the hay bales. Are you wrapping them tight enough? Uh, where are you storing them? You don't want them underneath the tree or, you know, they're getting wet, that sort of thing. So it, other things cause you to look around uh, at your feed storage if you wait a little bit. So do, does most uh, producers in Ohio, are they feeding for four to five months out of a year, they're feeding hay or, or? They can, four months maybe, although this has been a mild winter uh, this year. They, they're, they're using their hay, but the cows haven't had to work too hard here in Ohio as far as uh, cold stress. You know, I used to talk a lot about cold stress in North Dakota and those, and those ranchers understand uh, that situation a lot more. So yeah, you have to, you know, make sure you get those cows out of the wind, uh, keep the hair coats dry. And it's amazing how tough uh, a beef cow is if, if her hair is not wet or she's having to fight with the wind. Uh, one of my advisors was Dr. David Ains at Kansas State. And much and much of his research uh, dealt with uh, cold stress in beef cows and how, how in cold weather, a cow's energy requirements increase. So you got to find calories. Their requirement for protein doesn't change. Therefore, we don't need to use expensive protein supplements to help compensate those cows. Uh, so it may be just using more hay. They may well just eat more. Be ready for that. Uh, or maybe you're supplementing a little bit of some sort of grain. I, I like digestible fibers if I have access to them. Uh, soy hulls. I, I love soy hulls uh, to cows or backgrounding situations, you know, a couple pounds of soy hulls will match a couple pounds of corn. Mm -hmm. Now, when we get in a feedlot, that doesn't hold true, but in forage-based diets, some digestible fibers, wheat mids, uh, I, I often said in North Dakota, pigeon grass uh, weed seeds were the second major grain crop. Uh, you know, you can use some stuff like that. Admittedly, yeah, you may wanna, <laughs> if you're feeding pigeon grass, uh, do that on a sacrifice area. So that's where the weeds will come up. But, uh, you know, there's some cheap alternatives uh, that people can look at, perhaps. Yeah, so so cold stress is something a lot of people overlook. And, and they don't, uh, especially for periods of time that may be, you know, you get a week of cold, wet weather, that takes a massive toll on cows. 
And I don't know how it was uh, in Ohio, but back in, um, I think it was 28, 2019, in Nebraska, when I was in Nebraska, we had that bomb cyclone, and we were extremely wet, extremely cold for a month. Mm-hmm. And I had I had producers that their cows lost a full body condition score in thirty days, and and, and so much of the issue was that the quality of hay that they were feeding was so low that they were not increasing the energy intake. And really ran into problems. And so I think it's a key deal that you brought up is that cold stress is, is a massive issue that sometimes we don't consider. Right. It's get them out of the wind. But here you ask about, you know, cold weather. And I can't say we're like uh, the sand hills of Nebraska as far as in the wintertime. But what we do have is mud. Yeah, <laughs> and, mud. And there's interesting research showing how, you know, the depth, uh, dew claw, uh, you know, it can really increase the requirements. If anybody who's ever had to walk through mud or, uh, you know, deep sand, something like that, you get tired a lot quicker and that's because of the energy expenditure. So uh, people might need to think about moving their winter, winter feeding area around. Now they may think, well, that's inconvenient. The other thing you're doing by moving your winter feeding area around you're moving your fertilization program around to different locations. Instead of putting all that nitrogen, all those things for manure in one spot every year, if you move, can, can move that around, you are improving your soil fertility uh, as well in doing that. Now, that's a great point. That's a great point. Um, so what, what, what's the, the calving G- generally? Are you uh, mostly spring calving herds in, in Ohio or? Yes, uh, uh, we're probably getting into it now, late February and March. Uh, that's probably our busiest calving areas or calving season. So producers haven't looked at, uh, I know a lot of areas due to some of those issues with the cold to, to the mud, a lot of producers have been looking at getting out of spring calving and moving to summer calving or fall calving in a lot of areas. Has producers in Ohio started looking at that or has, are they been fairly traditional tied to spring calving? It's fairly traditional. We do have some producers that are doing some fall calving. Uh, and I don't want to dissuade people from it that fits your management program. Uh, you just have to deal maybe with flies a little bit more uh, yeah. with fall calving. But uh, no, it, it could well fit marketing programs. There's ag economists can talk about, you know, you know, selling calves when there's not many calves around uh, situations. So it may well fit uh, for a lot of people, even labor. Uh, maybe that works that they even split the herd and they have two different calving seasons. That, that's fine. I, I know we did a study years and years ago in North Dakota on if somebody had this many acreage, um, they didn't run out of money when they had to take care of crops, oh, you know, yeah. spring planting, harvesting, and they've got these cows. They ran out of time because we kept track of labor for all these different things. And yeah, labor was the one that really just said, well, we can't handle any more cows on a given, you know, several thousand acres, we just, uh, the person just ran out of time. Yeah, that, that is a challenge for guys that have both the cropping side and the livestock side is that you, that they're, they're very limited in when they can calve due to when they're planting, when they're harvesting, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. So let's, let's move to a slightly different topic of, you know, some of your extension programming has been training first responders and in handling incidents with uh, 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 transportation incidents with livestock. You know, h- how did you get involved in this and what's your role in some of these uh, training of uh, first responders and farmers and veterinarians? Sure. Uh, our crew or our team uh, is from Iowa State, North Dakota State University, West Virginia and Ohio State currently. But uh, Where we got into it is it's amazing how many accidents are out there on the road. When you roll a, uh, you know, a pot belly and and it has a human toll as well. Real situation, uh, had one of these, a truck hit a car and the the truck went over and there was death among humans. But guess who gets called? A volunteer fire department. 
and ranchers because they got the stock trailers. Mm -hmm. Everybody, every one of those volunteer fire department persons quit the volunteer fire department. There was, I, I don't want to get descriptive, but anyway, there was serious injury for human and animals. And even the, the ranchers that helped out in that situation won't talk about it. So plan to have accidents. They're, they're going to happen uh, more so in some places than others, but have a plan. We talked to the first responders. They are, they, they're really great people to work with, but they've got a call list or a procedure for say somebody having a baby and even some uh, human accident issues. When you've got to roll over a pot belly, be it hogs, chickens, or cattle, now what are you going to do? We often talk about deer being the deadliest animal in North America because of car accidents. I Think about the weight of a deer versus a 1,300 pound steer that's black. And invariably, a lot of these accidents happen from uh, midnight to four in the morning. That is a killer animal to be out on the road. So they need to have, we talk about have this phone tree. I'm using old fashioned terms, but a phone tree of who they're gonna call if you have one of these accidents. Uh, let's start with the trucker. This is somebody who is not hauling refrigerators. And invariably they probably don't own the cattle. You're going, they need to get a hold of that a bill of lading or anything that they've got there and find out perhaps if they can find the owner of the cattle. Uh, one of the things that happens here, Eastern Ohio will sell calves, uh, a cattle buyer. And the cattle buyer may say to the trucker, just start heading west. When you get to St. Louis, I'll tell you which direction to go from there. So they're on the phone trying to determine where there's cattle are going to go. So you need to at least start looking around for that information. Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of these truckers will have a dog in their in their truck. If they're severely injured, you may need to dispatch the dog to find out this information that you're starting to look for. So that's that. Then we've got these animals that are in, injured in the trailer. Hopefully they're still in the trailer. Yeah. You're going to have some farmers that we want the first responders to reach out to, but I just did a BQA transportation last week here in Ohio. And I was telling those beef cattle producers, you call the first responders and get on their list. As we tell the first responders, not just one producer or rancher on that list, maybe they're not at home, have two or three. Okay. We got that set up there. I'll mention the veterinarians in a moment, but the reason it's more likely a rancher is going to help out with an eye accident than be in one. Right. If they're on that list and they charge for their services, it's much easier to get paid. Insurance companies are great companies. They're not trying to do anything bad to people, but it sure helps with their paperwork is okay. Uh, rancher a, is on your phone tree. You called rancher a now they have submitted a bill for uh, trailer, truck, gas, and panels. That's going to be your source of panels for a first responder. And so they can charge for that. Now the veterinarian, it's the same situation. I speak at veterinarian conferences on this. I tell them, reach out to the first responders to get on that list. But when I talk to first responders, you need to get a veterinarian or veterinarians, if you can find a, a plural in rural areas, uh, a veterinarian on that list. And then, and it's just not any veterinarian. I know DVMs are just really smart people, but ideally you've got a veterinarian that is familiar with large animals versus dogs or cats. And the same business aspect stands out. That veterinarian rightfully should charge for their services at that scene of the accident. And so that's much, much easier to get paid. That veter the veterinarian or even the farmer rancher is not in charge. That's nice that you have. So you, you, you get the team together beforehand and say, we don't have an accident. We hope we never have to use you, but here's what's happened. And then they need to understand the rancher and the veterinarian, they're not in charge. They're bringing resource 
and expertise in animal handling and equipment, but it could be the fire marshal or highway patrol, get ready to be told what to do. And so you, you want that communication all set up before the accident. That way you know what's going to come. That's why first responders train, they train, they train. So at least sit down and say, okay, you know, I'm the sheriff, I'm in charge. When I roll up, if I say jump, I expect you to how high kind of if you get that chain of command worked out, the military's got that understands that then the plan is going to, everything's going to set it, come into place. And the first responder is going to be looking at the rancher and the rancher says, Hey, let's, let's back off on that animal right now. Cause it's agitated. We're, we're going to rethink how we're going to do this and how I think the, the, the containment area for the animals should be over here. Maybe it's in a low ditch or something to get animals away, but they're going to make some of those animal expertise calls. Then the veterinarian may be come into play there, but also they're making decisions on triage. There are animals that will not get up. Now, when we work with ranchers in highway accidents, we tell them not to go into the trailer for their safety. Uh, no, we tell the first responders, put on your riot gear, or they're going to work with uh, sticks that have a uh, captive bolts from outside, but they're going to be looking for that right veterinarian to help them make those triage decisions uh, with those animals. And then finally, uh, some of these, it's, it's amazing what a pot belly trailer, how the, it's a magnificent design. I think they're the second most expensive trailer out on the road. The only thing more expensive is a refrigerator trailer. Uh, you know, they're like a pop can. So we work with them. They're going to, at some point, maybe have to cut this trailer open. And so we climb into trailers and say, oh, well, cut here, cut here. You know, you're never going to cut on the bottom of a trailer. But uh, at the top, you know, where can you cut and not? It's like a, a pop can. There are places you can squeeze it with your hand and bend it. Whereas other parts on the edges, you can't bend it. And you don't want to. Uh, the, the insurance companies don't want you to demolish a trailer when you're uh, getting animals pulled out. Uh, and the sort of equipment they have to have, first responders have to have an appreciation. They're going to have, I'll call them big boy uh, wreckers. And that's not just for the truck or the, the, the trucks themselves. Uh, they're going to be pulling out animals, uh, that have hopefully been euthanized properly. That's one of the other things, even with uh, police officers, I know they're trained with firearms, but they need to understand where to apply euthanasia. Essentially, you go from the outside of a cow's eye up to where you'd think there's a horn, and then the other side. So, you know, it's a equivalent of a human forehead where to deliver euthanasia. Shooting between the eyes is a kill shot, but it's not euthanasia. And Unfortunately, there's a video showing uh, individuals firing into the sides of cattle. And it, it just, it, it makes it worse. Uh, so we talk about, have, we have euthanasia. We talk about the resources that are needed. I know this is morally about cattle, but if you have a rollover of hogs, you better have the state wildlife officer on your phone list. They're all hogs. Yep. That is true. So, yeah, we do a lot of that sort of thing. And it's been interesting uh, working with first responders. They're great people. It just let's let's have training in this area. What I do, uh, to be honest, is I'm a, I don't know if I call it a cow whisperer, but I get them to think about cows or livestock in general. The difference between. Travis, between you and I, we have trouble thinking about one thing at a time. Cattle are able to think about just one thing at a time. Now, they, their attention can be diverted, but if we can get their attention focused on us, not frightened, we can make those animals move. So I train uh, these people how to work, work those cattle. And then I like to work as much from the front as the back. And so we think about being behind the ear, the shoulder, getting those. So I, we have normally have cattle at these events and I kind of make, I stand beside the animal, make them forward, backwards, forward, backwards, and I'm just at the shoulder. Uh, I'm just making them do that. And then we often tell them, you know, that don't be directly behind those animals. I know this is elementary for probably for the listeners of this podcast, but hey, let's 
you, you've got an animal that can see 340 to 310 degrees, depending on how fat they are. If you're just off to the side behind, they see you. And that's, you don't want to sneak up on them or surprise them. That just causes additional stress. So those are, and I'll be honest, our, our national team, these are day long events that we put on. We have classroom and then we go out and look at trailers and work cattle, that sort of thing. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's been really interesting and enjoyable uh, to be a part of this group. Yeah. So have, have y'all seen much impact or change since implementing some of these programming areas of, of how they're, they're handled when these incidents occur? We have, we, we get, put it this way, success stories we hear about of people that have been trained and then they let us know about it. And a shout out or kudos to uh, Georgia. They had our crew in for two, two weeks time periods. Now there is a Georgia group that does all that training and uh, you know, that, a, a wonderful impact. If, if you think about it, Atlanta, if you have a, one of those pot bellies roll over in Atlanta and some of you folks that are from Georgia, that is one scary town to try to go through. <laughs> they got more lanes than most counties, <laughs> just in that downtown area. And they have a certain edict about, I think it's like eight hours. They got to get the highway cleared. There's just, there's definite rules and regulations on how they handle things there. So, uh, no, it, it, it showed a plus or a benefit to those that are ready to move and have been trained. You know, that the animal handling training within that, I think it's good even outside of these incidents. It's from, you always have cows getting out. So you always have cows on highways that, that jump the fence and, and, you know, having highway patrol, et cetera, being trained in, in animal handling is really important to, to get those cows back in, especially in some rural areas or even for us, universities that we have these facilities in in areas that we have populations and and, and we, we have animals getting out often and, and so that animal handling is, is i think is very important outside of that scope of incidents yeah no, you're right in that uh, another example of that, that you're not in a crisis situation but we got a cow out <laughs> in some rural area if you can find the hole in the fence and put a light on it They'll follow, they'll go to the light. And so make it easy. <laughs> Instead of looking for a gate that's a quarter mile away, if they've just wandered a little bit from a, a hole in the fence, put a light from, say, the police cruiser or something on that, and you can probably move them back in uh, to where they came came out of. So, so a lot of this discussion is really, I guess, helps lead us to the next segue into some VQA transportation some bruising issues that we've had for a while that I know BQ, BQA has been focused on of how do we decrease these bruising that happen during transportation that's a big loss when we think about uh, the, the cutouts that, uh, from, that can occur from uh, bruising. And so, so what, what's your programming around with BQ, BQA and, and you know, helping producers decrease or transportation guys that are hauling decrease that amount of bruising that occurs in hauling animals. Yeah. And a lot of the things we just talked about in animal behavior, uh, we talk about with uh, uh, farmers and ranchers. And one of my edicts is a market steer, something that's 13, 14, 1500 pounds should never run. So when you're unloading the pen, these cattle haven't been bruised yet, by and large. Uh, I like to open up the gate, stand next to the gate, and I, I just start moving. Remember, the one thing at a time, I want to, them to see my movement. They're also going to see the gate that's open, and many times they'll walk past me two to three at a time, not 15, 20 if I stand behind them. And that way, even if they're not going to market, maybe we're going to re-implant, I can look at their feet and legs and score them. If there's a lot of, on a one to four scale, uh, threes and fours, I have a problem somewhere in the pen. That's telling me something. But even with animals that are heading to market, twos and threes, just from there, aren't going to get it bruised as much. Then if you're in a big yard, uh, 
and I give credit to Kansas State on some work they did. Some of those pins are a mile away from the truck and they did two different things. They want, did low stress, they had a rider in front of the cattle that forced the cattle to walk uh, towards the truck. Where the other one, they just opened up the gate and those 13, 14, 1500 pound animals did a mile in seven to 10 minutes. I don't think I could do that without hurting myself seriously. And essentially, if we think about what those animals have been doing for over 200 days, the equivalent of sitting in a, a lazy boy with a big gulp in one hand, a massive sub sandwich in the other, they are not athletes. And so that's not bruising, but that's stress. We think about dark cutters, uh, that's uh, different ways to get dark cutters, but that's sure not gonna help. The, they, they pulled blood and everything there was not good as far as uh, dropping root, uh, the blood pH, that sort of thing. Uh, you use up a lot of the, the oxygen in the hemoglobin and that's gonna can lead to some uh, dark cutting issues. And then just using cattle speed, I often tell audiences, I'm 67 years old and I work cattle today better than when I was 18. I don't know that I know any more about cattle, but my knees are terrible. I, I can't yeah. jog, I can't run. So I move at cattle speed. And so, especially with those, those market animals, uh, bruises, we get bruises, but it goes away. Market animal that's gonna be slaughtered in 24 to 48 hours, nope. Uh, so we need to load those cattle slowly. Also the crew, here in the east, now, you know, out in Nebraska, Kansas, they're bringing in cattle every day and then shipping cattle out uh, every day. So you, those crews are used to, to, you know, they can be trained to do that. With folks like here in Ohio and Eastern, we may only load out maybe once or twice in a year. We need to train ourselves and our crews. I know you're used to doing these things every day with this feedlot or farm this is not a time to rush so you can get back to your regular schedule we need okay this is all this is the only thing that matters is loading these cattle on the truck and then they go off that's forcing that move the cattle at cattle speed onto the truck uh one of the other ones and i'll be honest an, an aggravation i'm not against hot shots i'm really not i would rather pick up a hot shot than do a nasty twist on a cow's or you know whatever tail but some individuals once they get a hold of a hot shot they think it's an extension of their body. Ideally, you set it down. <clears throat> I work with some packing plants and uh, training their crews. And once again, they're most of the, those are people that work, uh, say, bringing up cattle to packing plant, they didn't grow up on a ranch. Right. And so we have to train them how to move animals. And also, especially if there's an animal welfare auditor at these packing plants, uh, that's when I get called in, I'll be honest. Uh, I'm trying to break, bad habits put it that way overuse of a hot shot uh, on, on those animals so uh, anyway that those are a couple things anything we can reduce the bruising the problem with bruising is that has to be cut out we do not sell bruised meat and some people think well we put that in uh, the dog food or cat food whoa whoa whoa, whoa. pump the brakes pump the brakes there are people in this wonderful country of ours that are so poor, they go to the grocery store and buy wet cat food or wet dog food to eat. Therefore, the expectation is food safety needs to match what humans are. So that product, you know, it could be used somewhere else, but not as a food product. And it's millions and millions of dollars that we hits the floor at the packing plant. That's the cost of the packing plant. So anything like even the truck, uh, we find another situation of in a pot belly trailer, those steers, they don't see steps that often. They probably saw it when they came to the feed yard and now they're seeing it again as they're heading to the packing plant. Uh, if you could put down, maybe not even clean the steps that much. <laughs> and sprinkle something there to reduce that temptation to try to jump uh, at that point. So we find a number of, bru number of bruises across the back, and those are animals that are trying to jump. Uh, if I can put the shorter cattle in the belly 
uh, I'm going to do it versus if I've got a, you know, I've got a set of Holsteins or some tall cattle. If I can put them up, uh, up in, the, in that top part, I'm going to reduce some of those, that bruising that way. But even putting bedding down the middle in the belly, you don't have to spread it out. The cattle will do that. But if they see something natural, that may reduce that temptation to jump. And, uh, and when we're unloading the cap, oh, well, before I do that, uh, I often tell people that are actually moving cattle is don't think of it as moving cattle. Think of it as moving water. So those animals are still getting situated. If you think about humans on an airplane, even they, you know, airlines do not shut the door, hit the, you know, reverse button and roll out taxiway and then hit it. No, they give everybody a chance to put their stuff away. As soon as those cattle are loaded, they're not ready yet. They, if you can take a few minutes, five, 10 minutes, let them get situated, then slowly pull away. And then you, you think about the turns, hauling water, reduce some of that you know, back and forth swaying, that's going to reduce some of the bruising there. And even unloading, uh, well, for safety's sake, I don't go up into trailers anymore and try to unload. I'll open the door, you know, and we try to encourage those animals to come out, and they're going to come out slowly more that way. Uh, so anything, have a mindset, whatever you're doing at the ranch or at the packing plant, what are the things that are causing animals to fall or stumble, uh, that sort of thing. So uh yeah bruising oh, i i'd be making up a number but it's multiple millions and millions of dollars uh we, we've got room for improvement uh in that part of our uh, beef production all great information uh, one of my last questions is since you're you know in this phase of retiring and been in extension for so long is, so you think about the new generation of extension specialists coming up and extension has changed in your career. It's changed in my career of, of programming, formatting, how people want to view that information. Um, so, so how do you see extension moving forward in the future? And what does that look like for some of these newer specialists of reaching out and making an impact to producers? Absolutely. Well, I, I'm, I'm enough of tra traditionalist travels that I still like the in-person meeting. But it, technology or uh, what we're doing right now uh, is going to become more important. I still remember talking to a young, young producer one time, and that person said, I don't have time to sit down and listen to something for an hour. I know the podcast and there, there's a place for it. But that person said, I've got snippets of time. Maybe I'm having coffee in the morning at some place, having a biscuit and coffee, and they've got a snippet of time there, 15 minutes to look at something. So we have to think about that's another avenue of uh, accessibility, but also have it digestible as far as technology goes. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm very much a fan of the online, love it or hate it, I kind of hate it, but I, I'm willing to embrace it as far as videos, even videos, I don't think they should be longer than a song. Yep, right, right. It, yeah, but I've got some videos on heifer development, and I broke them down into like six different lessons instead of one big long one uh, with heifers. So, uh, and then all oh, this technology, uh, one of the research farms I'm working at right now, they're trying to use drones to read feed bunks. Uh, also look at cattle as they're moving through a gate, kind of instead of me standing there, you know, evaluating the animals. Uh, and that's so far ahead of me, Travis. I, <laughs> but it, it is out there. Uh, but there's still the place uh, that, that some one-on-one, -on -one, because coming, I'm going to come back to nutrition. The, the ration for rancher A will not be the same as it is for rancher B, and they could be in the same county. Different cap, different soil, different cattle. So there's still that place for one-on-one, -on -one, although uh, it was, it's been decades since I used a calculator and a pencil and a yellow uh, pad work up a diet, you know, very much have embraced uh, ration balancing software for many decades. 
Yeah, you know, that one-on-one is important because it's, it's a trust relationship. And to build that trust and, and relationship, you you have to have a actually have that relationship outside of some technology of them listening to you talk or viewing a video. And so that's still extremely important of building those relationships. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that communication is going to be important. It's time for our famous three. Yeah, so uh, the last few questions, and they're optional. Um, and so we'd like to ask, what, what's one of your favorite beef-related books that your go-to book uh, that you go to often? Oh, gosh. Uh, I, I'll, I'll call them some of the, the old books uh, out there. I'm, I don't want to step away from my, my – but I've got something from 1948. When was the last time uh, they've done research on feeding buckwheat to cattle or hogs? I have no clue. <laughs> That's where don't what I'm telling this podcast group. There's I'm sure some great nutrition books, beef production books out there, but don't forget. Uh, you know, if if I could, if there's a young nutritionist out there, uh, get feeds and feeding. They, they did it in 19, I know, 48, 49, uh, you know, some of those old books. Even in some of the nutritional, new nutritional books, there's plagiarism. Because <laughs> that's where that work is. Because you, you got to be ready. A lot of them are going to know how to feed corn. You live in the Dakotas, you're going to know how to feed barley or some Milo. But here's, if you're going to be a nutritionist, be ready for the, 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 the unusual and that, those are fun. Those are fun to work with. Th- those are very fun and challenging. Of we have this. How do you feed it? Like, never heard of this. Oh yeah, that's I. You know, you hear those. I've got. Uh, I had a producer call me, and I can get a load a load of watermelons free. And I said, okay. Yeah, I kind of looked up, make sure there wasn't anything funky. Uh, you got to figure out how to get them into the bunk, and that's your problem. But even if you figure that out, just be ready for those cattle to pee a lot because a watermelon is about 98% water and 2% dry matter. But it, it, those are fun questions. I had a spillover of Skittles one time. Ah. And, and how, how do you feed this? I guess we'll find out. Yeah, it was like five percent of the diet maybe 10 i'd be scared to go much higher than that just because the well the sugar is going to be so available so rapidly correct so what's your favorite book or resource that's not a ag book oh well i've been steadily watching the uh james harriet stuff and i i'm looking forward to rereading those when i retire <laughs> fair enough so in in your opinion what sets successful beef professionals apart than those that are not successful? Well, my father used to say, a good cattle person is not necessarily a good cattle person. They're a good grass person. And when we're feeding cattle, we're not feeding cattle, we're feeding rumen microorganisms. So, uh, you know, start there uh, with understanding your soil and grass. And then I have to admit, that's the part I'm not that uh, enthused about. It's a weak spot in me. But uh, that's what he used to say. And even if you're feeding different species of animals, you can have cattle and sheep, but you have to remember you're not feeding the same mineral to sheep as you are cattle. My mineral mixes have about at least 1,000 parts per million copper in them, and I'll put sheep down with that. Uh, So I would like to have the ewes uh, graze in front of the cows in that their, their nutritional requirements are higher per pound than a pregnant cow. And so you have to think about the grass that you have available and uh, take advantage of those management decisions. No, that, that's a, a really great comment that cow-calf producers are grass farmers. And so they're using those cows to harvest that grass. And so that's a very important concept that we can never get away from is, you know, that's our basis of everything and, and ma- maintaining and managing you know, our, our grasslands, our, our pastures, our, our rangelands are very important. And I think we're going to have to be more savvy on what have you just mentioned, like Skittles. There's there's a lot of feeds out there that are a byproduct of human uh, activity. I get requests to go to some developing countries, 
And that's one of my first questions. Where's your, where are your bread companies? Where are the cookie companies? Uh, even veggie burgers. I don't know, sounds like a dirty word to our audience, but there are veggie burgers that get thrown out. They don't meet the human standard. They can be fed to livestock. And I think more and more the survival or where we fit, it could be, we're taking much greater advantages of byproducts from human use uh, that we aren't doing that enough today. Yeah, when you think of our, our cost of production or from a nutritional standpoint, it's about 65% roughly of our annual cow costs. Byproduct feeds to help decrease costs are, are very important for a, a producer to, to decrease that, 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 that cost margin that they have. Yep, I agree. Well, thank you for uh, joining us today. I, it was a pleasure of interviewing you. It's a pleasure that, you know, this was your last, uh, maybe your last podcast before your big retirement. And so uh, def- definitely a pleasure and congratulations on the retirement and good luck and enjoy this next step and endeavors. Oh, absolutely. That was a pleasure. Appreciate it.